Welcome to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. I'm Craig Mish along with Davis Maddock. Our fantasy football season is off and running. And today we're going to take a look at the Jacksonville Jaguars here coming up in 2022. We've got that covered for you as well as Fantasy Reality, the Sports Grid 60, our top stories as well. Davis, excited to get into Jacksonville today. And, you know, I, I think a new leaf was turned by them in the offseason with Urban Meyer out and certainly Doug Peterson in. And Peterson with a pretty strong a track record of success. So hopefully that leads to the Jacksonville Jaguars being better than they were last year. Can't be worse, right? I mean, I, I definitely do not think they can be worse. I don't know if an NFL head coach, I mean, it's it's pretty much Urban Meyer and Hugh Jackson in terms of, you know, total lack of competency, you know, just burying young players. I mean, how many young players, uh, you know, failed to launch in Cleveland? How, I, and just imagine getting the gift of Trevor Lawrence at number one overall and just putting together this horribly uninspiring team. So I'm actually fascinated by the Jacksonville Jaguars. I think they are maybe one of the three or four most fascinating teams in fantasy football this year. So I think it should be a good show. Yeah, and we're going to get into them coming up in about 10 minutes from now. But first, let's get to our headlines here on the show. We do have afternoon baseball set to go in about an hour from now. We'll start off on the practice field. A lot of teams are doing those joint practices again this morning and this afternoon to wrap up the NFL preseason. Pete Carroll, by the way, saying that the Seahawks will take all the time they need to make a quarterback decision. They have not made one just yet. Drew Locke, Geno Smith, or two of the possibilities. Kevin Durant's going to return to the Brooklyn Nets. So that drama appears to be over, at least for the time being. Walker Bueller, we knew he was out for the season. We did not know that he would need Tommy John surgery for the second time, and that will probably sideline him for most of next year as well. And late yesterday, Fernando Tatis Jr. delivered his apology to the team, to uh, the fans, the media, and everybody else, and also announced that he's going to have shoulder surgery. So that will put him basically on track to return at some point next summer. Of course, he's suspended for the rest of the season and into next year as well. Um all right, so so let's get back to uh, football here a little bit because obviously I think that's what's on everybody's mind, no doubt. I have baseball on the mind too, though, no question. Does it really matter who the quarterback is in Seattle, Davis? I guess that's the question I would have for you. Does it really genuinely matter this season? Does it, do, do either of these quarterbacks have a chance to throw 25 touchdowns this year? I mean, it definitely doesn't matter in terms of either one of them being a fantasy starter. You know, I don't think it, even, uh, you know, even if Geno Smith or Drew Locke are like a, C plus NFL quarterback. I, I don't think it matters because Seattle doesn't want to play that way. It matters for four players though. Matters for Rashad Penny. Matters for DK Metcalf. Matters for Tyler Lockett. And matters for Noah Fant because all those guys are pretty good, right? You know, Rashad Penny was the number one running back down the stretch in the fantasy football playoffs. DK Metcalf has back to back years of double digit touchdowns. Tyler Lockett has been a top 20 wide receiver every year in fantasy football for the last five years. And Noah Fant is, uh, you know, a really good player who ended up in a pretty bad situation. So I, I think what, honestly, what you'd be asking for is if Drew Locke ends up being the starter, can he do his best Ryan Fitzpatrick impression, right? No one mm -hmm. ever thought a Ryan Fitzpatrick-led team was going to win a Super Bowl. But Ryan Fitzpatrick got lots of wide receivers paid and led some friendly fantasy football offenses, right? You know, his time with the Titans, with the Texans, with the Buccaneers. Those teams were never any good. He, he, I, don't, I don't know if Ryan Fitzpatrick has ever won a playoff game. I'd had to go look. But he got some wide receivers paid. He did fine. My guess, though, is that both of them are just going to stink. They are going to stink so bad, and Seattle is going to be the worst offense in football. Yeah, it, it looks like they're at the bottom. Bears, obviously, are going to be another team that's going to struggle a ton. Houston, Probably not great as well, but yeah, it'll be curious to see what Seattle does in this final preseason game coming up this weekend to see who they decide to start. Uh, okay, let's go to baseball. Tatis yesterday, Davis, you know, naturally he was already going to be suspended through the beginning of next season. This surgery probably, you know, it, it makes his timeline a little bit better. What's interesting is that he's decided to have it now that he's been suspended. You know, he was very adverse to doing this. And, and, you know, just kept, you know, sort of delaying and then that shoulder, whatever would pop out and then he'd miss time again. Uh, you know, from a fantasy perspective, he's going to be a really tough player to draft next season. And boy, I mean, if you only get three keepers, I'm not even sure what you do with Tatis, you know, wonderfully talented kid, but I, I don't, I don't, can you hang on for two years and wait for this guy? 
I mean, I suppose it probably depends how his rehab goes because the way the way I understood it is basically just that his recovery in general this season was not where he wanted it to be. And maybe Tatis is just one of these guys who's like a slow healer, and maybe you know maybe he's he's a guy who falls outside of the top fifty picks or whatever in fantasy baseball next year. It's it's interesting though. You know, everyone got so interested in the Padres after they acquired Juan Soto, and one of the things you and I talked about was you know, this is not necessarily just a trade for this year. This is a trade for next year. This is a trade for 2025, 2026, because eventually you should get a healthy Soto season, a healthy Machado season, a healthy Tati season. And with those mm-hmm. three guys and with the pitchers they have, and uh, I mean, San Diego weather, pretty nice, right? That should be a, they should be a real free agency destination. So I, I they're just a very fascinating team though. One of the have nots trying to join the big boys. You know, that's always just sort of an interesting sports storyline. And they have played extremely poor since the trade for uh, Soto. In fact, losing most of the series that they've played in. We'll see if they can get a turnaround and get in the postseason. It could be a little bit of a battle for them with those two teams in the National League Central and the Phillies are in the mix as well. All right, we'll take a quick time out here on the show. When we come back next, what is the upside for the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2022? They have a new head coach. Of course, one of the players that they drafted very high last year is back this year, missed the entire season. We're going in fantasy drafts. Davis and I will dive in next on the Jaguars on Fantasy Sports Today. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers games. And the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, coast CBG, to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley comes over there. Give me the game penguins. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game yeah, live all like access. Mandy. I like Mandy against Bam. I think Mandy can win the game, take a corner. In out. game oh, live man. prime oh, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The morning after. Kalia Copper was sensational, 21 points for Chicago. And then in game two, Copper backed it up with 20 more big ones, going over 18 and a half for her points prop tonight in each of the opening two games. If Chicago is going to win a decisive game three on the road in New York, Copper and her outstanding offensive performance will be a reason why. Over 18 and a half points. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. This non-story is officially over. Tom Brady went away. Why? Because he can. He's Tom Brady. His wife, very publicly, has wanted him to retire. He did. And then he unretired. So, in a meaningless week of practice, he went out and was able to spend some time with his family. Make sure that everything is good. It was reported to be a work-life balance. It was reported that the Bucks knew it was coming. Only on Sports Grid. Sports professor Rick Haro inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your daily numbers game with some pretty staggering numbers. First week average viewership, NFL preseason, about 1.7 million and 2.15 million on the high side. Now, put in perspective, Major League Baseball, a little higher at two. The PGA Tour, first playoff round, about a three. But let's remember, these are no names vying for non-spots on large rosters and in some cases, tape delay. And here's the bottom line. It is a significant number for people to come back and watch a second time and a third time where they know the score. Same thing for tickets. The one home or two home alternates this year and the last year are bought as part of the season ticket package. People may grumble, but they certainly take advantage of it, and the NFL's juggernaut continues in earnest. Sports Professor Rick Haro, Daily Numbers Game.
Welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. Last season, the Jacksonville Jaguars decided to make an out-of-the-box hire, and Urban Meyer was brought in to coach the Jacksonville Jaguars. That did not last particularly long, just a month or two into the season. Urban Meyer had his issues. He was let go. Uh, Jaguars did really not uh, fare much better over the course of the season. They did have that big win the last the last week of the year against Indianapolis. But Davis, as you uh, you know, sort of illustrated at the beginning of of last season, when you essentially take a generational type quarterback and make no mistake about it, Trevor Lawrence was that guy at Clemson, winning national championships, even in the losses in the games that he played in, looks fantastic. You would have expected a better result. But then naturally, Davis, we are reminded that not every first-year quarterback that goes on to get in the Pro Football Hall of Fame has a good first year. And there's a lot of evidence for that. Peyton Manning is a great example. In fact, the comp for Lawrence tends to be Peyton Manning, who you know didn't run as much as Trevor Lawrence is going to run. So I, I think that you would probably expect a pretty big jump from him this season. So let's hit on him quick, and then I want to go through the ADP of all of the players and the, uh, that people are taking in Jacksonville. Yeah, I mean, Trevor Lawrence was an absolutely phenomenal quarterback at Clemson. 2018, true freshman, 30 touchdowns, four interceptions, you know, just like unbelievable, multiple time. Yeah, just guy, the guy is incredible. Comes into the NFL, has like decent wide receivers. You know, a lot of the times we have these rookie quarterbacks come in and they enter into a team that is just totally bereft of talent. That was not the case for the Jacksonville Jaguars. The offensive line was not great. Uh, his buddy, Travis Etienne, suffers the list Frank injury in preseason that was not great you know they had to play uh some some non-talented running backs but really i mean in to in my opinion urban meyer was the source of all these troubles he just was not a good coach did not set trevor lawrence up for success same for ryan schottenheimer you know a guy who has just kind of failed out at a lot of different spots in the nfl so i have some real optimism with the new coaching staff in jacksonville and uh, yeah, I, I am definitely betting on a Trevor Lawrence comeback because this might be one of our, our best chances to, to bet that Urban Meyer was in fact the worst coach that the NFL has seen. I mean, we saw in Cleveland, right? Hugh Jackson left and all of a sudden the Browns are, are winning playoff games against the Pittsburgh Steelers, the big brother in the division. So I'm, I'm just fascinated by this team in general. I mean, Hugh Jackson was a really good coordinator for many years before he became a head coach. The Urban Meyer is like on another level, I think, amongst all. We probably really have to go back in history to find somebody worse. But uh, let's go through the average draft position of all of the players that you'll be taking in your drafts this weekend on the Jaguars. As Trevor Lawrence's ADP is 155. Travis Etienne, who missed a season, you're not going to find many rookies who miss a season with an ADP this high the following year. His ADP is 44, late third, fourth round. James Robinson is at 113, Christian Kirk 106, Marvin Jones Jr. at 206, and Evan Engram is at 182. He'll be their new tight end this season. So let's get a little bit more into Lawrence. Right now he's the 18th quarterback off the board in the NFFC, Davis. So that means that he, he enters the season not starting for anyone in fantasy, essentially. 18 is too far down, I think, to think that. But he is the one quarterback, I think, that between, let's say, 13 and 18, that it would just take one big game, I think, for him. And if you have one of those back-end quarterbacks, 10, 11, or 12, you probably, you know, just roll Lawrence out there the rest of the season. It's a, it's a very interesting dynamic with him. I think maybe the most upside from anybody in that top 20. Yeah, I mean, I think Fields has more upside than him probably because Fields is a better runner and will run more often. Now, Lawrence is going to absolutely dominate Fields in passing statistics. I, I think Trevor Lawrence could throw for, you know, 4,200 yards and 30 touchdowns-ish. I think he could have sort of a Kirk Cousins-esque passing season if he is as good as people thought he was heading into the NFL. And, you know, as he struggled last year, you have to put some doubt in that projection. You know, I'm, we can blame a lot of it on the coaching staff and stuff like that. But you also have to acknowledge that Lawrence uh, did not play as well as we thought. And and sort of, um, you know, with every rookie quarterback, the ghost of Josh Allen's rookie season hangs over everyone now. Josh Allen, maybe the worst quarterback you've ever seen his rookie year in Buffalo. More interceptions than touchdowns, was fumbling, taking sacks, looked horrible. Then he became an MVP candidate two years later, right? So that's kind of what we all think with these young quarterbacks. I personally... I think what would have to happen for Trevor Lawrence is he would have to run, uh, you know, more than he did last season. He ran a little bit in college, you know, 18 rushing touchdowns, including eight rushing touchdowns his final season. If he runs for, you know, kind of like how Dak Prescott runs where he's not 
Uh, not a ton of design runs, but he'll scramble and he'll run near the goal line. Uh, you know, six rushing touchdowns, 400 yards for Trevor Lawrence. I think he could finish as a top 12 quarterback. He he is pretty interesting. And they, you know, they added talented guys. They they overpaid for Christian Kirk and Zay Jones, but those are professional wide receivers. They go four deep in professional wide receivers. They add Evan Ingram. They add some help on the offensive line. Like, uh, you know, it, it, and, and ETN, if he is as good as he was at Clemson, could kind of do what Kamara had done for Drew Brees at the end of his career, where, you know, Drew Brees is throwing little five-yard flip passes and Kamara's ripping them off for 50-yard touchdowns and helping Brees out in fantasy. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, too. Uh, I, I really think that that Lawrence is going to be a top 10 guy by the end of the season. And, you know, you mentioned all of the talent around him, but what we have seen from Carson Wentz the last five years, Davis, he was at his best when that coach was there and Doug Peterson. So I, I'm very curious to see what he can do for Trevor Lawrence this year and the creativity that they show with him running out of the pocket and doing the things that Wentz did that made him a success, at least temporarily in Philadelphia. All right, let's go to ETN here, who was arguably the best running back in college football when he came out. And very quickly, we found out last year we weren't going to get to see him play at all. Now, uh, most of the training camp reports, it seems like they're just kind of taking it easy with him, to be honest with you, Davis. I don't really see a ton with him happening in the preseason or even in these in these scrimmages. It's probably because they're going to save him for the season. But as I said before, historically speaking, when a player misses an entire year at a skill position like running back as a rookie and then comes back the next year and his ADP is 44, my gosh, like this tells you there's some super high expectations for this player. Yeah, I mean, ETN, his final two seasons at Clemson basically looked exactly what we want a running back to look like. Um, you know, he had uh, he had 90 receptions those final two seasons, six receiving touchdowns, over 10 yards per reception, looked amazing in the screen game, looked amazing running routes. And like, the, look, I mean, that's just the name of the game. We talked about this yesterday, talking about the Colts, like, you, you just got to take Christian McCaffrey over Jonathan Taylor because McCaffrey is so much more active in the passing game. They, those are just free points in fantasy football and ETN. Um, you know, would not be surprising to me to see ETN be like the third leading receiver on the Jaguars to end up with like 60, 65 receptions. If he, if he stays healthy for the entire year. And that's, that's really the only question I have about him. There's also been some talk that James Robinson, you know, who, who returned very fast, from this Achilles injury, the the team actually likes him on third down more than Travis Etienne because he knows, you know, the pass protection stuff. And we always go through this with young running backs, although it's not like James Robinson is this cagey veteran. I'm I'm not particularly worried about that. Etienne to me is just a much better player. And the Jaguars, the Jaguars play in a very weak division. I think that's maybe something that gets kind of overlooked here is like, I mean, they could win eight, nine games. They could they could be dreaming about a second wild card. The AFC is a very tough conference, so maybe not. But they could they could maybe surprise us in terms of wins. And if you're surprising in terms of wins, the skill position players, the absolute best guys, are going to be out there a ton. Yeah, Colts, Texans, Titans in, in that division. Not the, not the world beaters, that's for sure. Let's hit real quick on James Robinson. Davis, I know that you weren't even on him last year. I remember you jumped off that bandwagon. Uh, eight touchdowns for him last year. You mentioned they liked him on third downs. I think they just like this player. They like who he is. They like the fact that every player that comes into camp sees this guy and he was a nothing and then all of a sudden one of the great running backs for one year in the NFL. I think he's going to stick around, but probably less of a workload. Yeah, I mean, he def like he's going to play, right? There, There is no scenario where he is not a thorn in the side of Travis Etienne. I'm just not betting on a guy who's not that athletic with the Achilles injury. Yeah, fair enough. All right, coming up next... We'll move from the running backs to the wide receivers and tight ends. This is our preview of the Jacksonville Jaguars from a fantasy football perspective here on Fantasy Sports Today. And we'll continue looking at them next. Stay on the bridge. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio, 
Listen free on the Sports Grid radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The morning after. Why are you buying in on Dylan's stock for 2022? Aaron Jones has been remarkably consistent for the Packers, and I kind of see him playing almost a Alvin Kamara role in the slot, setting about wide. And I think they're going to they're try and save him from taking this, you know, ground and pound, and they're going to leave that role to AJ Dillon to have this kind of more of a balanced approach because they need a little more consistency in their passing game. I think it helps that the Packers' offensive line is right now ranked fifth. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Football is always so much fun because you see new players literally every single year and the anticipation is stupendous once it gets underway. And we're really close to that. A 1230 game overseas this weekend between Northwestern and Nebraska. And yeah, you're going to settle into Connecticut playing Utah State with a 27 and a half point line. Everybody gets a Big Ten Pac-12. We cannot wait for this. Only on Sports Grid. Fantasy Sports Today. The running back that appears to make the biggest jump maybe in the last two months, uh, maybe in all of fantasy, honestly, Davis, is Damian Pierce, who played for the University of Florida. And the beef that went on at Florida, Davis, is that people wanted to see him get the ball more. He really was never a primary running back at Florida. He's sort of a throwback guy in the sense that you give him the ball, he's never going to lose yards. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. This is yet, I'm told, the fourth, at least the fourth different offense that Mayfield has to learn as a professional in his five years. And from the very start, Pharrell, they kind of knew it. I'm told after two weeks, he was so dominant over Darnold. It wasn't bad, but the fact of the matter is his timing was good. I'm told a couple of the throws are a little bit high. They feel that the time will be better as these guys work together. The Sports Grid Network. Hey, welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. Our team by team fantasy football previews are continuing here on the show today as Davis and I are taking a look at the Jacksonville Jaguars. Let's have a look at the NFFC average draft position from several of the players if you're drafting this weekend that you could consider. Travis Etienne's ADP is 44. That's late third, fourth round. Christian Kirk is at 106. He comes over in the offseason to start a wide receiver. We have James Robinson, 113. Lawrence inside the top 200 at 155. And uh, yet another tight end. We're on a bad tight end streak here, honestly, on the show with uh, Evan Ingram checking in at 182. All right. So uh, naturally, Davis, you know, uh, when you and I do shows, certainly I remember names. One of the names that I remember a couple of years ago, I'm not throwing you under the bus here, but uh, this guy, LaVisca Chenault. I remember Jacksonville had him. They had DJ Shark, they had Chris Conley, they had all these receivers that they were throwing out there with Gardner Minshew and, and even Trevor Lawrence, and it seems like this was the one point of contention in the offseason that Jacksonville looked at who they had and said, you know what, to bleep with it, we're just going to go ahead and just wipe out everybody we got, bring all these new guys in. I guess the question is, did they do a good job, in your opinion, of doing this? Um, Good job. So... The guys they acquired, I think, are better fits for what they needed. But because they are the Jacksonville Jaguars, they couldn't go out and get A.J. Brown. They couldn't go out and get Marquise Brown. They couldn't go out and get these, you know, super marquee names. You know, Devontae Adams was not requesting a trade to go to the Jacksonville Jaguars. So, uh, you know, and and people could argue about this. Like, but when you're the Jaguars, you are just going to have to pay to get mediocre guys, right? Christian Kirk is a good NFL wide receiver not a great wide receiver. Zay Jones is a competent NFL wide receiver, but certainly, you know, not a great NFL wide receiver. Evan Ingram 
is a competent tight end who has been misused and injured in his career. But in general, I do like what they did uh, compared to like what the Bears did, right? With Justin Fields, they were like, you know what, kid? Good luck. We're giving you Equinemius St. Brown and Byron Pringle. You figure it out. And the Jaguars at least have created an environment where the guys on the field are all competent at their jobs. What happened with Chenault is he cannot play on the outside, right? He just is totally incapable not fast enough, not a good enough route runner. He can only play in the slot. And they signed Christian Kirk, who is a good slot wide receiver. So LaVisca, you know, I loved him. I think he's, uh, I think we will see a little bit of him this year, kind of in an offensive weapon type role. He'll get some carries and things like that. Uh, but he's pretty clearly, I think, the fourth wide receiver on this team. But uh, I mean, I, I just think uh, Christian Kirk in particular is super interesting because he's never been cast as a number one wide receiver before. Yeah, you made the great point, too. I don't think people understand that. They ripped this deal because of how much money they paid Kirk, but it's absolutely true. We see it in all sports. Davis, who is going to Jacksonville? You have to overpay to get these players, and, and I don't think people realize that. Uh, but Kirk last year had over 900 yards, five touchdowns, and his ADP uh, this season is right around the ninth round. It looks like 10th round. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess if you had to start him as your wide receiver, too, going into the season, you, you pretty much failed in terms of your draft. But I, I think as a three, he's a pretty good shot or a flex. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would be, uh, no, number three is pushing it. I mean, I draft yeah. very wide receiver heavy on my teams, probably, uh, definitely I draft much more wide receiver heavy than, than the average fantasy football player. But I mean, if you tell me that Christian Kirk stays healthy for 17 games, Trevor Lawrence plays, you know, closer to the expectation of what we thought Trevor Lawrence was going to be when he was drafted, it would not surprise me to see Christian Kirk end up as a you know top 20, 25, top 30 wide receiver in fantasy football because he is really good near the line of scrimmage and good after the catch. But also, you know, the thing that was so appealing about him with Kyler Murray was he was also great down the field. We all remember that three touchdown game against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Like I I think that uh, you know, I think that he could excel in both of those roles in Jacksonville. And and you know, fantasy football is so fickle. You know, one one seventy five yard touchdown could bring Christian Kirk from being a wide receiver forty one to the wide receiver yeah. twenty eight. You know, that's how close the margins are. But I am definitely interested in Kirk where he is going in drafts right now. All right, and after Kirk, it gets really dicey because I, I think someone will step up this season and become a solid number two. But look, I mean, uh, Marvin Jones. Davis right now is on the back nine of his career. I mean, he had a nice career in Detroit, but it is, you know, obviously it's winding down. Uh, maybe he gets a little bit of a boost. The numbers were okay last year, but he's falling outside the top 200. Did you take Jones at all in, a, in any uh, draft, the early draft? I mean, I would only take Marvin Jones in a draft where, you know, I already had Trevor Lawrence and uh, the role that I think Marvin Jones is best capable of filling. I mean, he's entering into his age 32 season. He had his worst season in terms of efficiency last year for the Jaguars, 6.9 yards per target, you know, playing all those years with Stafford. He was over nine yards per target. He was used a little bit more down the field. Uh, he is going to be like the red zone guy, right? Because Evan Ingram doesn't really fit that role. Marvin Jones, big body guy, you know, he's got, he had that four touchdown game as a member of the Cincinnati Bengals. And I think ideally if things worked out, for the Jaguars, Marvin Jones would be in a rotation with Chenault. That would be the guy who he, Chenault would be spelling. And when Chenault comes in, uh, Christian Kirk would go on the outside. We'll see how that ends up happening. You know, they also have Jamal Agnew, the converted uh, punt returner, kick returner guy who ended up playing wide receiver for them last season. But I, I, there's just absolutely no upside with Marvin Jones, right? I mean, there just is not a chance you are ever feeling comfortable if you have to start Marvin Jones. Yeah, I don't think so either. We'll get into some other names potentially that are out there. I, I think that there could be some names at running back and receiver on this team that we haven't talked about. Just, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of, you know, questions, I think, going into the year. They, they're a better team, but you never know. Uh, okay, and then Engram. I mean, we're going to, are we going to do this again this year with Engram Davis? I feel like this is like three or four years running. Uh, you know, somebody comes out and says, this is the year. It doesn't happen. He gets hurt. Three touchdowns, 400 yards last year. He's actually inside. It's crazy that he's inside like the top 20. But, you know, naturally he's your backup tight end. And and I don't even know that he's like a, a DFS guy either on a, on a given week. I just haven't seen it from him. 
Yeah, I mean, the the thing is, we are just all continuing to chase the Evan Ingram season when he was a rookie. I mean, one of the best rookie tight end seasons uh, of all time. 115 targets, 750 yards, six touchdowns, uh, played in all but one game, no injuries for him that season. And generally speaking, in fantasy football, Evan Ingram is sort of the profile of guy you would like at tight end. He is not going to be used to block at all. They have Dan Arnold uh, if they need a tight end in there for blocking. And Evan Ingram, I mean, also he was playing under, you know, we're talking about bad coaching. Uh, I mean, Joe Judge might have been worse than uh, Urban Meyer last season, like pretty close between, uh, you know, Freddie Kitchens calling plays for the Giants. And then uh, before that, it was Jason Garrett who got fired midseason. And Jason Garrett was trying to use Evan Ingram like he was Jason Witten. And I, so I, I like, you don't, I guess tight end is such a weird position in fantasy football that I can buy a story about anybody, right? I mean, the the bar to being a startable tight end in fantasy is so low. Like, four for 40, pretty good on a given week. If you score a touchdown as a tight end in a given week, you are probably going to be top 12 at the position, right? (laughs) So 700 yards, five touchdowns, which is, you know, what Evan Ingram did as a rookie with the Giants. If he can do that, he is, I mean, he's going to out-earn his spot. And uh, I mean, the other thing you like about Evan Ingram is not a guy you are going to have a hard time cutting if he is not playing well, or if he gets hurt, because we've seen this movie with him start the year, you know, doesn't get a target in week one, picks up an ankle injury and is questionable for week two. You're like, you know what? I'm I'm out. I'm done. I'm I'm picking up. I'm uh, going to pick up Mo Alley Cox, right? I'm just moving on from that position. So I I don't hate taking Evan Ingram. All right. So uh, let's close it out here. Now, ETN, if healthy, fine. James Robinson, if healthy, fine. There are questions there at running back for sure with Jacksonville, even questions at wide receiver. I, I, w- I would think there are a couple of players, Davis, being drafted outside the top 200 that at least need to be acknowledged for the potential of getting some playing time this year. Yeah, I mean, they, they signed Zay Jones to a big contract relative to what Zay Jones has done in his career. Uh, Zay Jones has been in the NFL since 2017. He's got 11 touchdowns, only 311 targets, did actually have a 102-target season with seven touchdowns for the Bills back in 2018 when Josh Allen was a second-year player. And, you know, he's fine. You know, he caught he caught the game-winning touchdown uh, for, the, for the Raiders in that week, that crazy week one game against the Ravens. And um, I think he's probably better than Marvin Jones at this stage in their careers. You know, Zay Jones is much younger, entering into only his age 27 season. He's fast. He can play on the outside. And just kind of one of those situations where if Trevor Lawrence is the tide that rises all boats and Zay Jones stays healthy and Marvin Jones is a 32-year-old veteran wide receiver who can't be out there for all the snaps. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident Zay Jones is like going to be a guy we are starting in fantasy this year. All right. And uh, third string running back? I, I mean, Carlos Hyde, I don't even know. Is he on a team this year? It feels like Hyde ends up back in Jacksonville or somewhere who do they have? Yeah, he's not. They have this guy. They have this guy, Snoop Connor, who went to Ole Miss. He's actually like kind of interesting um, a little bit. You know, scored 13 touchdowns in the SEC last year, caught some passes. He's he's like a little interesting. He should he, we should see a little bit of him. All right. So there you go. That's our look at the Jacksonville Jaguars here on Fantasy Sports today. As a reminder, we post all of our videos from all of our previews over on SportsGrid.com and our YouTube page. So you can check them out there. Each and every day, leading right up until the beginning of the NFL season, we're going to preview a team in the NFL, and we will have another one for you tomorrow right here on the show. But coming up next, it's time for some fantasy or reality, and then the Sports Grid 60. we got the early line coming up at the top of the hour. I'm back with you at 2 o'clock Eastern on Newswire, so make sure you stay on the grid with us throughout the day. Football season is coming. College football begins Saturday. Can't wait for that as well. We'll have more fantasy sports today. Coming up next for you right here on Sports Grid. Don't go away. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio, 
Listen free on the Sports Grid radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The morning after. Why are you buying in on Dylan's stock for 2022? Aaron Jones has been remarkably consistent for the Packers, and I kind of see him playing almost a Alvin Kamara role in the slot, setting about wide. And I think they're going to try and save him from taking this, you know, ground and pound, and they're going to leave that role to AJ Dillon to have this kind of more of a balanced approach because they need a little more consistency in their passing game. I think it helps that the Packers' offensive line is right now ranked fifth. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Football is always so much fun because you see new players literally every single year, and the anticipation is stupendous once it gets underway. And we're really close to that. A 1230 game overseas this weekend between Northwestern and Nebraska. And yeah, you're going to settle into Connecticut playing Utah State with a 27 and a half point line. Everybody gets in the way. Big 10, Pac 12. We cannot wait for this. Only on Sports Grid. Fantasy Sports Today. The running back that appears to make the biggest jump maybe in the last two months, uh, maybe in all of fantasy, honestly, Davis, is Damian Pierce, who played for the University of Florida. And the beef that went on at Florida, Davis, is that people wanted to see him get the ball more. He really was never a primary running back at Florida. He's sort of a throwback guy in the sense that you give him the ball, he's never going to lose yards. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. This is yet, I'm told, the fourth, at least the fourth different offense that Mayfield has to learn as a professional in his five years. And from the very start, Pharrell, they kind of knew it. I'm told after two weeks, he was so dominant over Darnold. It wasn't bad, but the fact of the matter is his timing was good. I'm told a couple of the throws are a little bit high. They feel that the time will be better as these guys work together. The Sports Grid Network. Welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today. For those of you who are on Twitter, you can follow us at SportsGrid and at SportsGrid TV for the latest news, notes, information, picks against the spread, and all our college football coverage coming this weekend. Also at 2 o'clock Eastern, Davis, I'll be talking about this uh, new golf uh, series, basically with the PGA Tour, Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, making the announcement. I see it on social media. looks like uh, PGA Tour is going to have some events on Mondays, one-day events, too. So a lot to talk about for sure. Yeah, I mean, the PGA Tour, I think, correctly looked at the situation and was, if if we don't change anything, if we keep everything the way that it's going, uh, our product is going to get worse. The top players on tour are going to take more money elsewhere. So I think some of the changes they did are great. I don't know how I feel about Monday Night Golf. I definitely don't love, you know, a bunch of no-cut events added to the tour. We are, you know, we, I guess the one we have this weekend is good. The tour championship is always pretty good, but no cut events are, I mean, to me, just not, not as fun, not as engaging, but um, as a, as a a noted fan of professional golf, I I welcome any positive change. And uh, you have to think that some of the guys who signed up on uh, the live golf tour, you have to think like, ah, they're, they're probably regretting it right now because these changes have been pretty sweeping from the PJ tour side. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. All right, let's get to some fantasy or reality. All right, Davis, the Los Angeles Angels made an announcement yesterday after our show that the team is going to be exploring the possibility of selling the franchise. Now, it's obviously been a very checkered past for the Los Angeles Angels and their owner, Artie Marino, and his sons, as since getting to the World Series, 
about 20 years ago, they've had almost no success and they have the best player in baseball. And some people feel like they have the best two players in Major League Baseball. But look, not for the lack of trying. Let's be clear, Davis. They did sign Justin Upton several years ago. They signed Anthony Rendon. Uh, you know, they, they've tried. They've, ju- they've just failed with all the players that they've added. They've gone through three general managers in the interim time, a couple of different managers, three different managers as well. Fantasy or reality, Davis, if the Angels are indeed sold, a new owner will fix the Angels. So the reason why this is so complex is you would think that generally the ownership problem that you get in professional sports is that the ownership is not willing to pull the pocketbook out. But that clearly has not been true with the Angels, right? I mean, Otani makes a bunch of money. Trout has this massive contract. They sign Rendon. They have brought in free agents. The way I understand the situation, and Craig, you would have more information on this than I would, is that the infrastructure, the front office, the just the in general day-to-day and team management decisions are just done in a suboptimal way in Los Angeles. And, you know, I don't know if that is because they don't have a good analytics staff. Like, I, I don't know what is at the source of it, but you can just look at the Angels roster. You can look at the product they put on the field and you can be like, none of this makes sense. It just does not make sense for this to be the team that is out there. You can't have Trout and Otani and not be an, at least an 85 win team. So I, I'm just going to, I'm going to guess and say reality because I would guess that whatever ownership group, big, you know, rich billionaire guy who decides to buy the team, I would guess that they would start to run the angels more like a business, which would be a more effective way. So I'm going to guess reality. Yeah. It's a complicated one, as you said, because there are so many elements involved and a lot of this is the owners being very heavily involved, the team, not just Artie Marino, but his sons on a day to day, as far as, you know, the operation or concern, you know, I, I sort of have fantasy to begin here because Davis, if we look historically speaking at these monster markets, with so much money to spend, the Angels are going to be in that category. Make no mistake about it. They're going to be sold for what two billion dollars somewhere along those lines. But Davis, what did the what did the Cubs do? They tore it down. What did the Red Sox do? They tore it down. What did the Phillies do? They tore it down. So, is there a chance that initially the Angels decide, you know what, Anthony Rendon, Shohei Otani, they're not going to get rid of Trout, but Anthony Rendon. Shohei Otani, Syndigo, you know, they got rid of Syndergaard already. Any of these contracts of guys making a lot of money, let's rebuild the farm system for a couple of years and then fill in with the huge free agents. So I think long-term reality, I think short-term fantasy. I, I don't see an immediate bright future there. And then this is happening now. So what does it mean for the incoming owner? Do they want these contracts, Davis, on the books when they're buying the team? That's a very big question as well. Sometimes these guys got to get moved out before they make the sale, just like um, just like Soto in Washington. I mean, Soto, I mean, what was that franchise worth with Juan Soto as opposed to out of it? Obviously, whoever's buying the team wants to start over. Yeah. So fantasy initially, reality long term. But I kind of get the feeling that this is going to be a built through the farm system initially and, and kind of step back from everything there, which does not bode well for their immediate future, in my opinion. All right. We found out yesterday that the Kevin Durant, Steve Nash, Sean Marks feud, if there was one, is no longer one, at least initially. Now, we've seen the NBA play itself out before, and these things don't always end in good marriages. That's There's no doubt. But for the time being, Kevin Durant's going to be a member of the Brooklyn Nets to start the season next year. That puts a lot of pressure, I don't think as much on Sean Marks as it does on their head coach, Steve Nash. Let's also consider, by the way, Davis, Steve Nash, Hall of Fame player over the course of his career, too. Don't mistake that for nothing. Fantasy or reality, Steve Nash will coach at least 41 games with Brooklyn this season. And don't forget, the reason Steve Nash got hired in the first place was because Kevin Durant wanted him, right? It was not, it's not a coincidence that Steve Nash was on the coaching staff in Golden State when Kevin Durant was there and then ended up being a head coach for the Brooklyn Nets after, uh, I forget the name of the coach they had before, he, he refused to play DeAndre Jordan, who was Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving's, but I mean, just... Kevin Durant really has done a number on the Brooklyn Nets franchise, right? So, so they're this good, interesting team. Before they make the eight seed, they they play hard. They have you know Karis LeVert 
and and all these guys, and then they end up with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. They get like 29 games a season out of Kyrie Irving. They uh, tra- they get James Harden, then they trade James Harden away. They have Ben Simmons. Who knows if Ben Simmons is ever going to play? However, Kevin Durant clearly lost this power struggle, right? I mean that that's just, that is I think the only way to interpret these events is that he said, Joe Sy, you got to bend the knee to me. I'm the superstar. I'm the man. And Joe Sy said, you know what? You signed a four-year contract. I don't believe you're going to hold out. I think you're going to show up to the office and play. So we're keeping Marks. We're keeping Nash. Reality. I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think it is more likely that a Kevin Durant trade does end up happening than Steve Nash gets fired. Because if you're Joe Sy, you cannot, you cannot have this public declaration from Kevin Durant that you got to fire these guys and then not do it and then bend the knee later. So I got I got reality. Nash is gonna is gonna be the coach in the Nets. Yeah, I have reality too. And look, every coach is different here. I, I find it really hard to believe that they're gonna bounce this guy halfway through the season, given the fact of who he is and and as you mentioned, the fact that he was brought in with Kevin Durant. Now, at the end of the season, could they make a change if it does not, not go well? Sure. But the other part of this, too, is that just because Durant wasn't traded now doesn't mean he can't get traded in a month or two. That could change, too, if they end up getting, you know, some team decides they want to make the move. So I have Nash there long term, and it does seem like ownership planted the flag and said to Durant, hey, we can't make a deal, and we're keeping Marks, and we're keeping Nash. So like it or figure it out. Yeah, I, I, I got reality, just like you, more than 41 games this season. All right, a video went viral over the last couple of days, there's actually two videos that went viral. One in Oakland. Maybe we'll hit on that one tomorrow. Uh, this is a different one where uh, an individual sitting in a Major League Baseball game took a hot dog out of a bun and uh, took a straw, put a hole in it, and drank the beer uh, with the hot dog, basically as a straw. So we will ask the question. We like to do food here on the show. At the end, Fantasy Reality, Davis, you would try a, using a hot dog straw, very similar to this gentleman that did it at a baseball game. Uh, no chance. I mean, literally, I, I don't, I don't really like hot dogs that much to begin with. I mean, I, you know, uh, the pretty much the only time I'm ever getting a hot dog, Craig, it's golfing, right? So you go out, you, you got your, you got your 10 AM tea time, you play nine holes, it's hot. You go in, you get a hot dog, you get a Gatorade, you go back out, you play nine morals. But even then, uh, when you're at a nice golf course, I, I, I normally go cheeseburger instead of the hot dog, you know, as soon like, Obviously, if it's, uh, you know, your local municipal golf course and they just have the hot dogs on the roller, like you're not ordering a hamburger from there. But I, I, I mean, hot, like hot dogs are just gross, right? I mean, they're just, it's, it's floor meat from the meat packing facility. Like you don't want that. This is, this is totally foul to me. I am, I am uh, opposed to the hot dog straw. So for me, this is, this is a fantasy. I'm not trying this the next time I go to a game. Okay. Uh, I'm probably not going to try it, but it's just asking, would I try it? The answer is yes. So I, I do have some uh, interesting background for this. Now, many years ago, Davis, I, I used to travel with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I lived on the West Coast of Florida. And as part of the travel schedule, if you remember, there well, once upon a time, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Davis, played in the same division as the Green Bay Packers. So they played against each other twice each year. And every time the Bucs would play the Packers, I would go to Wisconsin and I would go to Lambeau Field. It was the one trip that I wanted to make sure that I did every year. I even went there for preseason games, too. And I I got to know some people from Wisconsin. In fact, I used to stay at their house when I was a lot younger. And every year I would go there. And in the backyard, they would have this huge grill. And what they would do is they would have these fresh sausages that they would buy from wherever their local market was, you know, in Green Bay. I don't even remember. And uh, and they would take Davis a bunch of beer and they would pour the beer into the pot and they would cook the Wisconsin brats. They were called. They still are called. You can buy them now very easily at any grocery store. And they would cook them up in beer, not water, but beer. And these things were so good, Davis. Like you, I cannot even begin to tell you. I could have eaten like five, six at a time, and I like had to stop myself. So uh, I, I'm not a huge beer fan. I don't drink beer all the time, but cooking those brats up in the beer made me think of this yesterday. Not quite the same, obviously, with a hot dog and you're drinking, and it's a little odd and bizarre. But because of that, I will say reality. I will give that a shot. 
because I, I have had this before. I don't know, Davis, if you've heard of this before, but they would just take the natural light, pour it in the bucket, cook it up, heat it up, throw the bro- uh, brats in two hours later. You, t- you taste nothing ever like it. Unbelievable. I would eat that. I mean, I, I, I also, I mean, a key distinction here, bratwurst, very different than a hot dog. Bratwurst, you know, you you know the animal you're eating, right? It is, it, it's cased, it's packed. It is, is a totally different experience, right? I love, I love bratwurst. I will, I will have three bratwurst or whatever, but a hot dog, different, different experience for sure. But I would, I would totally, I would totally do the beer bratwurst. Yeah, that was, that was my introduction to that for, for many years. I still say, folks, if you've never been to anything and you have the bucket list for things in the world to go to in terms of sports, the one thing left for me is the Masters. I have not been there. But uh, Lambeau Field, to me, going to a regular season NFL game in Green Bay, and at tailgate, it goes at the top of the list of, of anything that I've been to. Even in me, and I went to playoff games there too, but meaningless NFL games, the experience is like nothing else that I've been to in professional sports. All right, we got to take a break here on the show. Coming up next, it's time for the Sports Grid 60. And then we'll turn it over to Kevin and Donnie. They have the early line followed by Newswire, 2 o'clock Eastern. We'll wrap it all up right after this. Stay on the grid. be the next daily fantasy millionaire no matter what you watch or where you play learn from the world's best dfs players lineup building tools expert projections and advanced stats change the way you play the game dominate the competition dailyroto.com the player's choice the morning after Who wins the American League Central? I recently had a change of heart here, and it's the Cleveland Guardians. I think that the Guardians are going to win the American League Central. I think that what they do in terms of offensive depth, I know we talked about that with Houston a couple weeks ago. I think that Cleveland runs out an incredibly deep lineup. I also think that they run out a very solid front three in that rotation with Shane Bieber, Tristan McKenzie, and Cal Quantrill. The Sports Grid Network. Sports today. Now at tight end, uh, Mo Alley Cox Davis is one of those. I, I feel like over the course of 17 games, I'm going to be doing a show with you, or I'm going to watch a show somewhere else, and someone's going to tell him this is the week at DFS to play Mo Alley Cox. I think the thorn in his side, though, is going to be the tight end that they drafted in the third round this year to kind of take up some of those Jack Doyle snaps. Who is Jelani Woods? The Sports Grid Network. The early line. The team that's got a lot of people excited, Nebraska. The second best odds to win the Big Ten West. Last year, this team won three football games. Only one win in Big Ten play. But if you're looking like a team total guy like myself, even a win total guy, you're going to be looking at Nebraska saying, something has to change, and maybe the quarterback changes what they needed. Only on SportsGrid. Pharrell, coast to coast. Do you believe he has the stones to fire both of them? His dad would have. I don't. Uh, I think Boone. I think Boone is safe, no matter what happens. Maybe if they don't win the East, but that's almost impossible. So I think he's safe. Uh, Cashman's contract, I believe, is uh, up uh, after this year. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I would think he'd be in more, uh, a lot more trouble than, than Boone was. The Sports Grid Network. Great, great. 
Welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. As always, we end the show with some final commentary before we send it over to the early line at the top of the hour. Here's Davis to close us out with the Sports Grid 60. I'm going to absolutely shock Craig here by not talking about football in the Sports Grid 60, but talking about baseball. Because, Craig, my Kansas City Royals, I mean, we've, we've basically been begging them to do this since they won the World Series. They are mostly all in on the young guys right now. Uh, you know, they still have Salvador Perez playing a couple times a week, and, and Nicky Lopez, who they love for some reason, is still getting plate appearances. But if you look at their lineup, I mean, they just have, they're just playing the kids. Service time, uh, you know, th- doesn't matter. Nick Prado is in there. Uh, Drew Waters, who they just traded for from the Atlanta Braves, switch hitting outfielder. They are uh, they're playing him at every different outfield spot, left field, right field, center field, just kind of seeing where he can fit. And uh, you know, we are we it's it's August right now, but Craig, we're gonna be here. We're gonna be in March, and I'm gonna be like, I don't know, my Kansas City Royals. I got they got Mondesi back healthy. I'm I'm getting optimistic about their future again. Lord help me. Yeah, I uh, I know how you feel, but believe me, I've been going through it here with the Marlins now for five years. I think they're on the same trajectory, which is where I'm not really sure. Uh, Len Dawson passed away. It was reported earlier today, Hall of Fame quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. And, and I think Dawson, known for his days in the NFL, also known for people like me. Uh, this was before the days of watching all the games in the NFL where you had to tune in to HBO on Tuesday nights after the season uh, each week was over because that was where all the highlights were compiled by NFL Films and they would host a show called Inside the NFL. It was must-watch TV. It was really the only spot that you were going to catch all of the NFL highlights and Len Dawson was part of that show. So rest in peace, Len, Hall of Famer, and certainly uh, in the mind of a lot of people today who cover the NFL. That'll do it for the show. Thanks to our graphics department and, of course, LTN. For my co host Davis Maddock, and my producer, Brett Levy, I'm Craig Mish. I'll be back for 2 o'clock Eastern for Newswire. Great, great.